Hi everyone, I'm David Block. And I'm Imu Shalev. Welcome to the Parsha Experiment. Instead of picking one or two episodes out of the Parsha to focus on each week, we try to uncover some of the grand themes that seem to tie those episodes all together. Parshat Lech Lecha begins the story of Abraham. Right. Abraham is this famous founder of monotheism. We're going to read all about how he smashed his father's idols, how he was condemned as a heathen by Nimrod for his faith in the one God, how he is miraculously rescued from the oven of fire. Abraham has this tent with four doors where he and Sarah missionize and teach thousands of converts all about God, their creator. The problem is, none of these stories are actually in the text themselves. They're midrashim, commentary by the sages, and it's not always clear whether they're intended to be taken literally. Wait a second, are you telling me that the fact that Abraham was the first monotheist isn't even in the text? I'm afraid not. Adam and Noah were both monotheists. It's clear that the text itself seems to emphasize some different qualities about Abraham, other than the fact that he believed in one God. So what does the Torah want us to know about Abraham? What made him so special? That's what we're going to explore this week on the Parsha Experiment. So before we dig into this question, let's do the 22nd Parsha recap. First, God asks Abraham to journey to Canaan. Then, Abraham is driven by famine to Egypt where he says that his wife is his sister. Lot and Abraham then separate and Lot moves to stone. There is the war of the four kings versus the five kings. Then Abraham and God forge the Brit Benabitarim, the covenant between the parts. There's the episode of Hagar, Sarah, and the birth of Ishmael, and finally, the covenant of circumcision. Now, we're not going to be able to get to the bottom of every story in just 10 minutes, but this week and next, we may be able to get a lens through which we can better understand the character of Abraham. Much of what we're about to say borrows from Rabbi Foreman's mind-blowing audio series called Abraham's Journey. Links below. Check it out. You won't regret it. So let's see if we can start to gather some clues about Abraham from the way he's introduced in the beginning of the Parsha. God tells Abraham to leave his home and to go to Canaan. The gadol. God will make Abraham into a great nation. Sounds pretty great, but that's not all. Abraham listens, he follows God, and when he gets to the land of Canaan, Abraham's gifts get even better. God appeared to Abraham and said, I'm giving this land to your children. If you were Abraham and you heard that news, that this land would be yours, what would you do? I don't know, I'd be elated. I'd, I'd probably throw a party or something. And then I'd probably set up shop. I'd build a house or a city. I'd mark my territory. After all, God just promised me this land. It's mine. But Abraham's reaction to hearing that news is actually remarkable. And nothing like that at all. He builds an altar to God. Okay, so maybe he is first saying thank you, and now he'll build himself a home. But then, instead of settling down in one place, he actually moves. He moved from there to a mountain east of Beit El. Okay, so maybe he liked that place better. So now you'd expect him to plant roots and to build a house. But still no. Vayet Aholo. He pitches his tent. A tent is so temporary. It's for a traveler, not a settler. And what does he do in this new location? Vayiven Shamizbeach la Hashem. Vayikra b'shem Hashem. He builds another altar and calls out in the name of God. Notice that Abraham isn't averse to building permanent things. It's just that he's not building those things for himself. It's almost as if he's going out of his way not to mark his territory. How strange. And in the very next verse, he travels again. Abraham traveled and went further south. What's going on here? Is Abraham just so antsy he can't stay still in one place? Why doesn't he just settle down, build a home, enjoy his life? And why is the text telling us all this? It just seems like a boring travel log with a few altars thrown in for good measure. And finally, why would these be the first stories in our Parsha? Shouldn't the text be telling us who Abraham is, maybe giving us a resume of his accomplishments, and then tell us what God's plan for him is? This would be the perfect place for some of those great Abraham stories, like when he smashed his father's idols or when he preached to the masses. Instead, we hear about all of his wanderings and these seemingly trivial details. But maybe our problem is what's now become a classic Parsha experiment problem. We're looking at the story in isolation instead of seeing it in its larger context. Let's ask. What big event happened right before all these stories? 
right before God first speaks to Abraham. The Tower of Babel. Exactly. If you remember, in the last two Parshas, we spoke about God creating a world for humanity in order to have a close relationship with them. What followed were a string of sins that distance humanity from God, culminating in the story of the Tower of Babel. We discovered that perhaps the Tower wasn't about fighting God or anything like that. It was about the dangers of forgetting God and focusing only on yourself. Marveling at their own technological creativity, they said, Hava nivna lanu ir, umigdal Let's build a city and a huge tower up to the sky. But why? For what purpose? Vinaase lanu shame, to make a name for ourselves. Confronted with their own impermanence, the tower builders were afraid they would be forgotten. And instead of strengthening their relationship with the only eternal being, they worshipped at the altar of their own creativity and built a tower. Vinaase lanu shame, for their own legacy. But look at what happens when we compare that story with the very next chapter, with the beginning of Abraham's journey. When we look at these stories side by side, we'll see that the narratives are similar in some respects, but that they also differ in some very important ways. Let's take a look. Abraham traveled towards the mountains east of Beit El. It seems like it's just a geographical detail. But now look at the beginning of the tower story. They traveled east, and they found a valley in the land of Shinar. But what did the builders do when they get to their destination? They settled there. And what does Abraham do when he reaches his destination? He pitches his tent. It's like the text is begging us to realize the contrast. Both the tower builders and Abraham travel east. But while the builders settle there, as a permanent residence, Abraham simply pitches a tent. Then the tower builders make bricks and say, Let's build a city and a tower. It wasn't enough that they settled there. The text tells us that they built a city and a tower. A city has a function. You live in it. But what was a tower for? A tower is a monument. One that reaches to the heavens. A monument to their own legacy. Back to the Abraham story. The next thing Abraham does after pitching his tent is He builds an altar for God. That's the same word we had at the tower, Nivne and Vayiven. But what they build is very different. The builders want to build a monument to themselves. Abraham builds this monument, an altar, for God. What is an altar? It may be more telling to think about it not in terms of its function, but in terms of its purpose. An altar is a structure that's used in the service of something, to worship something. So, if you think about it, the Tower Builders Monument was really an altar too. And they don't hide what it is they're worshipping with their impressive altar. Themselves. said lanu shame. Let's make a name for ourselves. But look again at what Abraham does when he builds the altar. Vayikra b'shem Hashem. He calls out in the name of God. Abraham and the Tower Builders both really care about shame, about names and legacy. But Abraham doesn't care about his own legacy. He promotes God's. Here's a theory for you. The text seems to be suggesting that Abraham's actions are really the antidote to the Tower Builders. That's the link that connects Abraham and really the whole rest of the book of Genesis to what happens before. It was right after the flood and the Tower that God seems to implement a new plan for humanity. He chooses one man to start a nation, to model a relationship with God. They'll right the wrongs of mankind and set them off on a better trajectory. And now, let's come back to the idea of name. Right at the beginning of the Parsha, God tells Abraham, I'll make you into a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. Wait, God's going to make Abraham's name great? But that's what the tower builders wanted, to build their own name. Why is God so interested in making Abraham into a nation? And why does it matter if his name is great? God tells us in the next few words of the verse, Through you, blessing will come to all the families of the earth. After multiple failures of humanity, God picks out one of humanity's successes. He's going to make that small success into a massive one. And here's how. Abraham's nation focuses on God's name, so God will make Abraham's name great. The nation of Abraham are role models for the relationship with God, and through them, by putting them on a pedestal, by making their name great, 
That's how blessing will come to the families of the earth. And that idea carries on now in Judaism thousands of years later. There's an idea in Judaism that whenever possible, we try to do good deeds or model godly values in the world. And you know what that's called? Kiddush Hashem, sanctification of God's name. We, like Abraham, become models of these godly values, not just through our beliefs, but through our actions, like ambassadors of God. And when we're successful, it's kind of like our own version of building that altar and calling out in God's name. So is that it? The rest of the Abraham stories are all about him traveling the land, sanctifying God's name, and teaching people good values? Not quite. Not every story fits into that category. There's actually a built-in challenge to the mission of Abraham. If God's going to make your name great so that you can bring blessing to the rest of the world, how do you balance being the prince of God with the pride and arrogance at having been handed that destiny? How do you stop yourself from becoming a tower builder? Take a look at something that many of us take for granted right at the beginning of the Parsha. When God first talks to Abraham in Canaan, we assume that God is giving Abraham the land. And that's why it's so strange that Abraham wanders around and pitches tents. But the text doesn't actually say that he's giving it to Abraham. God says, I'm giving this land to your descendants, not to Abraham. And the verse before that is very careful to tell us that when Abraham gets the land, the Canaanites were there. While the land might eventually become his, Abraham does not take what he does not yet own. Abraham's deeply sensitive not to promote his legacy at the expense of others, not at God's expense or even at the expense of the Canaanites. So he doesn't settle down. He constantly travels and he lives in tents. And when he does choose a place to stay for a few nights, he doesn't build a home or a city for himself. He builds a mini tower, all for God. So when we asked at the beginning, what does the Torah itself want us to know about Abraham? This seems to be the answer. It's about Abraham becoming a model nation, living what it means to be in a relationship with God. It's not just about smashing idols or escaping from a fiery oven. It's about the successes and the struggles that come along with fulfilling that mission and creating a legacy. We don't have time to go through the rest of the Parsha, but here's our challenge to you. Reread the story of Abraham, but pretend you don't know how it ends. Abraham sure didn't. Each of the stories may be really exciting on their own, but don't lose sight of the link between these stories, or of their significance in the larger story of the Torah. And, as you read, try reading it through the lens of legacy. Ask yourself, what does this story tell us about how Abraham is doing at his mission to bring God's name into the world? Where is he succeeding? And where is he facing personal struggles that might come along with the promise of legacy? Can you see how the binding of Isaac might take on a new light? Or the stories with Sarah, Hagar, Lot, and Ishmael? And when you're ready, check out last year's Parsha video where Rabbi Foreman follows this thread through some of the stories in this week's Parsha. Or, if you're more ambitious, check out Rabbi Foreman's audio series, Abraham's Journey, where he really delves into these stories in stunning detail. It will make the character of Abraham truly come to life. And of course, join us next week on The Parsha Experiment. Hey everyone, these Parsha videos are only the beginning of the story. For more evidence and to take a look at some of the stories that we didn't get a chance to cover, check out some of the other videos on our site, linked below. And if you have any thoughts about the significance of these stories or how they connect together, we'd love to hear them. Please share your thoughts below.